An explanation of the powers of Franz Mesmer. Space precludes me from recounting the whole story of Franz Anton Mesmer. There are many controversies, and his methods incurred the ire of the established medical profession, both in Vienna and in Paris. All I can do here is give an overview of his theory and practice. The essential point to bear in mind is that Mesmer was an exceptionally charismatic human being. Dr. Wolfart, who edited and wrote a preface to Mesmer's last work, said about him, His marvellous skill in treating the sick by his penetrating gaze or merely by his raised hand inspired feelings of awe in the beholder. Also, the list of maladies that Mesmer was reputed to be curing is impressive, including dropsy, paralysis, gout, scurvy, blindness and deafness. It is 1784. You are in a dimly lit salon in a mansion in a prosperous section of Paris. The room is presided over by a tall, slightly overweight man dressed in a purple cloak trimmed with lace and embroidered with occult symbols. Other signals decorate the walls and heavy velvet curtains over the windows, allowing just the odd ray of sunlight in to strike the thickly carpeted floor and hardly a sound penetrates from the street outside. Melodious piano music can be heard softly from another room. You and a number of other Parisians are seated around a large low tub, and there are other such tubs in the room, three for the rich and one for the poor. However, there are a few poor people at their tub, since it is fashionable Paris, that is fascinated by this new science. Movable iron rods stick out through the cover of the tub and have been bent at right angles so that from where you sit on chairs around the tub, you and others can hold the rods or apply them directly or by means of an attached rope to an afflicted part of the body. The other end of these rods, you have been informed, are resting in files of magnetized water and these files in turn stand in a pool of water containing magnetized iron filings. The wizard, who is none other than Franz Anton Mesmer, calls this contraption a baquette, which just means tub, and explains that it or the attentions of an individual healer, such as himself, can restore the lost balance of the magnetic fluid which pervades the universe and animates, animates all living creatures, and whose disturbance is ill health. The group of clients grasp the rods and wait in silence. The atmosphere in the room grows very intense. Occasionally, Mesmer or one of his assistants prowls around the room to complete his appearance as a wizard. Mesmer carries a wand with a metal tip. He inspects the woman next to you, passes his hands over her back without touching her, points the wand at her, and she goes into convulsions. Her body begins to jerk, and her breathing is shallow and uneven. A flush comes over her face and neck. Finally, she collapses gently to the floor, coughing up phlegm. Assistants calmly come and take her away to another room, which you can see is lined with mattresses and soft silk drapes. Mesmer follows to attend to her now that she is on the road to, Ill to health. Here's a 1779 account of Mesmer treating an army surgeon for kidney stones. After several turns around the room, Mr. Mesmer unbuttoned the patient's shirt and, moving back somewhat, placed his finger against the part affected. My friend felt a tickling pain. Mr. Mesmer then moved his finger perpendicularly across his abdomen and chest, and the pain followed the finger exactly. He then asked the patient to extend his index finger and pointed his own finger toward it at a distance of three or four steps, whereupon my friend felt an electric tingling at the tip of his fingers, which penetrated the whole finger towards the palm. Mesmer then seated him near the piano. 
He had hardly begun to play when my friend was affected emotionally, trembled, lost his breath, changed colour and felt pulled towards the floor. In this state of anxiety, Mr. Mesmer placed him on a couch so that he was in less danger of falling and he brought in a maid who he said was anti-magnetic. He, when her hand would approach my friend's chest, everything stopped with lightning speed and my colleague touched and examined his stomach with astonishment. The sharp pain had suddenly ceased. Mr. Mesmer told us that a dog or cat would have stopped the pain as well as the maid did. Mesmer came to the conclusion that magnetism has a twofold nature, the mineral magnetism present in metal and the animal magnetism present in the human body. Some persons are endowed with unusual amounts of animal magnetism. This animal magnetism issues from their fingertips in such quantity that it can be sent as a healing force into afflicted parts of the other human bodies. Mesmer made no further use of actual magnets from 1776 onwards, and, the, and he stressed that the bucket which he had used in his salon in Paris was just an accessory. In his dissertation on the discovery of animal magnetism, Mesmer makes it clear that his practices operate on the mental as well as the physical level. Everything in nature communicates by a universal fluid. Nerves are the best conductors in the body for this universal magnetism, and by touching these parts, you effect a happy state of mind and bring on a radical cure. This implies that a mo if a movement of this subtle substance is elicited within a body, there immediately occurs a similar movement in another body sensitive to receiving it, whatever the distance between the two bodies. Mesmer composed a list of 27 propositions to explain his animal magnetism. He talked of a responsive influence between the heavenly bodies, the earth and all an animated bodies, a subtle fluid universally, universally diffused which underwent an ebb and flow and a reflux which was experienced by the animal body directly or by its insinuation into the substance of the nerves. What follows are his propositions 9 and 10. 9. Properties are displayed analogous to those of a magnet, particularly in the human body, in which diverse and opposite poles are likewise to be distinguished, and these may be communicated, altered, destroyed, and even reinforced. Even the phenomenon of declination may be observed. 10. This property of the human body which renders it susceptible to the influence of the heavenly bodies and of the reciprocal action of those which environ it manifests its analogy with the magnet, and this has decided me to adopt the term of animal magnetism. King Louis VI appointed a scientific committee to investigate animal magnetism. The committee ultimately published a report debunking the methods of Mesmer and other practitioners of animal magnetism as nothing more than the power of imagination. The American scientist and diplomat Benjamin Franklin was, of the commissioners, was one of the commissioners in the majority opinion. Franklin's report condemned Mesmer not because his treatments failed to work, but because he had no physical explanation for their success and he astutely observed, some think it will, will put an end to mesmerism. But there is a wonderful deal of credulity in the world, and deceptions, as absurd, have supported themselves for ages. One of the commissioners, Dr. Jusieu, published his own dissenting report. They have failed to make use of the positive results of magnetism not investigated thoroughly, and I for one regret this negligence because I am convinced that an insight into the force behind animal magnetism would be infin infinitely illuminating. The human body is subject to influences like imagination, which must be from within or due to moral causes. 
Others, such as rubbing or touch, must be external and physical. The psychiatrist and medical historian Henri Ellenberg considers Mesmer the very first psychodynamic psychiatrist, a physician who conceptualizes mental illness as resulting from inner psychic processes. EEG frequency analysis today tends to focus on the issue of band frequencies associated with hypnosis, specifically the question of whether one band frequency, such as alpha or theta, is a more responsive of the hypnotized brain. Many studies in the area suggested that hypnosis is an alpha state. This notion was widely popularized, even leading to higher consciousness workshops on learning to generate alpha rhythms and the creation of special alpha wave synchronizing machines made commercially available to help you do so. However, hypnosis is not simply an alpha state. The research on alpha waves as an indicator of hypnosis is quite ambiguous, but some research regarding alpha waves suggests that they may indeed have some relationship to hypnotic susceptibility either before or during hypnosis. Studies of EEG brainwave activity tend to show that the theta band is associated with higher levels of hypnotic susceptibility both in eyes open and eye closed pre-hypnosis baselines and also during the induction of hypnosis. Theta is also associated with focus attention, clearly a necessary component of the hypnotic experience. Thus, as individuals enter hypnosis, EEG theta power intends to increase. This increase may be observed in low hypnotizables as well as highs, but is more pronounced in highs. It is generally accepted that some therapists have the ability of being hypnotic, <clears throat> which actually enables them to modulate or influence these slow-wave theta oscillations. This can be done by their ability to develop and enhance rapport, the timing and phrasing of language, and environmental factors such as music in the waiting area, calming versus chaotic clinic environment, which all can influence oscillation patterns and therefore clinical responsibility. Nobody doubts that Mesmer himself must have had this ability of being hypnotic. There are a number of other strategies that have been shown to increase theta activity, such as music or monochrome sounds. Some meditation training practices and neurofeedback feedback explained below. <clears throat> The modern definition of hypnosis is very broad and general, and there cannot be any doubt that Mesmer's patients would be included. For as long as your attention is directed in an absorbing way, either inwardly or on some subjective experience, or outwardly on some external stimulus, which in turn creates an internal experience, and you are responsive to suggestions to alter your experience in some way you can reasonably said to be in hypnosis. In his book, Trans, Trans Work, An Introduction to the Practice of Clinical Hypnosis, Michael Yapko tells us right up front that it is inevitably that hypnosis will influence the patient. It is an important starting point in studying hypnosis to recognize the ever-present nature of interpersonal influence. In studying the fascinating realm of social psychology in particular, you learn almost right away that influence is inevitable simply by your being there. The mere presence of another person alters your behavior. It is not a question of whether you will influence your client, you undoubtedly will, but rather a question of how you will influence him or her. Communication to absorb and occupy the, the client's conscious mind is the starting point in the hypnotic interaction, such communication is called induction. It is also important to bear in mind that when you focus on something, you amplify it in your awareness. Generally, we are told that the foundation of the hypnotic experience involves the focusing of the patient's attention on a specific stimulus, usually your words or gestures. 
to the near exclusion of other ongoing stimuli. In Mesmer's case, the specific stimuli were his words, his magnetic apparatus, the passes with his hands, his magnetic wand, etc., etc. A seance with Mesmer presiding may be considered a global stimulus upon which the patient's attention was focused and in which the patient was fully absorbed. The literature in hypnosis and psychotherapy generally employs the word rapport to describe the ideal positive interrelationship between hypnotist, clinician and client. Deleuze, in his influential L'Histoire Critique du Magnetisme, tells us that this notion of being en rapport with the patient date back, dates back to Mesmer himself. Once the hypnotist has established this rapport with the patient, this normally becomes the patient's first official hypnotic experience. Use of the experience as a foundation for the future similar experiences starts to condition the patient to the experience of entering hypnosis while having his or her experience guided by the clinician. Thus, the patient has an opportunity to build a rapport in the relationship with the clinician, begin to build trust in the clinician, and begin to build confidence in his or her own ability to experience hypnosis. This explains the apparent ease with which Mesmer could make his own long-term patients respond to his procedures and about which the investigative commission were highly sceptical. According to Milton E. Erickson on engendering confident expectations in the client, which of course was something that Mesmer was masterful at doing, every effort should be made to make the subjects feel comfortable and satisfied and confident about their ability to go into a trance. And the hypnotist should maintain an attitude of unshaken, contagious confidence in the subject's ability. A simple, earnest, confident manner is of paramount importance. Another celebrated hypnotist, Paul Watzlawick, PhD, stresses, stresses that the need to communicate with the unconscious mind of the client in order to be as influential as possible in therapeutically altering his or her experience. Here again it may be assumed that the mood and atmosphere of Mesmer's salons, as well as the elaborate apparatus he used and also the general social ambiance, were all calculated to address his patients subliminally. In Mesmer's time, the unconscious mind had not even been formally proposed but we may assume that he knew instinctively how best to draw his clients into his sphere of influence. Some would even suggest put his clients under his spell. Above all, modern hypnosis stresses the need for the hypnotist to establish sufficient rapport and responsiveness in the client. Josephine Hilgard, PhD, asserts that hypnotizability was best predicted by the capacity for the imaginative involvement, which she defined as the capacity for nearly total immersion in social, in some activity, to the exclusion of irrelevant competing stimuli. Interestingly, the commissions that were set up to investigate Mesmer gave as their primary reason for denouncing him as a charlatan that he was merely appealing to the imagination of his patients. The animal magnetism part of his theory, and in particular the magnetic fluid, had no physical reality, notwithstanding that his patients were able to respond to it imaginatively. <clears throat> Not only do higher hypnotizables have this capacity for imaginative involvement, but they are also said to be fantasy prone. Another negative finding made by the commissions was that most of Benzema's patients were women, that his techniques, techniques mainly work on women because they are weak-minded and more prone to flights of imagination, especially when the suggestions are coming from a man. The modern attitude in the professional community concerning gender differences in hypnotizability 
is summarized as follows. The difference between men and women has been equivocal. That is, in general, there has been a consistent small difference found favoring women over men, but never at even the level of 5% significance. This has led past researchers to reject the existence of a difference. Their difference is much too small to be of practical importance or to indicate something that would be theoretically important. Vive la différence! If most of Mesmer's patients were women, and given the fact that women are slightly more prone to hypnosis than men, then it's reasonable to assume that much of Mesmer's success was indeed due to his ability to hypnotize his patients rather than working on their animal magnetism and harmonizing their magnetic fluid, as he thought. Latest research in radiogenetics. In in 2014, a research paper was published in Nature Genetics, which launched a new direction in optogenetics, which is known as radiogenetics. Radiogenetics will make it possible to remotely control biological targets in living animals without wires, implants, or drugs. A research team at Rockefeller University used electromagnetic magnetic waves to turn on insulin production to lower blood sugar in diabetic mice. A naturally occurring iron storage particle in the body, ferritin, when exposed to a radio wave or a magnetic field, can activate an ion channel called TRPV1, which in turn leads to the activation of an insulin-producing gene. These two proteins, ferritin and TRPV1, acting together as a nanomachine, can be used to trigger gene expression in vivo. And it is all done by radio waves. The method allows one to wirelessly control the expression of genes in a living animal and could potentially be used for conditions like haemophilia to control, control the production of a missing protein. Two key attributes are that the system is genetically encoded and can activate cells remotely and quickly, says Jeffrey Friedman, Marilyn M. Simpson, professor, head of the Laboratory of Molecular Genetics at Rockefeller University. We are now exploring whether the method can also be used to control neural activity as a means for non-invasively modulating the activity of neural circuits. Radiogenetics is being heralded as being more effective than other systems in optogenetics that simply use light as the on-off switch, which tend to be only effective near the skin and require permanent implants. Originally, the researchers used low-frequency radio waves, which heat or move the ferritin particles and the TRPV1, which is situated in the membrane surrounding the cell opens up a channel allowing calcium ions to flow through and activate a piece of synthetic DNA implanted upstream to the gene they want to turn on. In this case, it was the gene that synthesizes the protein insulin, but it seems that in this way they can activate any gene of interest. Interestingly, the researchers were able to achieve the same result by manipulating the ferritin with a magnetic field, which recalls the theories of Franz Mesmer in the 18th century about animal magnetism and the magnetic cure. It could well be the case that a hypnotist is able to channel his her brain waves, which are elf or radio waves, to manipulate the ferritin in the cells and genes of his her subjects. Mesmer himself stated that the magnets were immaterial to his treatment, and what was essential was his state of mind towards the patient. He was willing the patient to be healed, and it is well settled that the brain waves, ELF radio waves, of healer and patient become synchronized. Conclusion This talk does not claim that Franz Anton Mesmer invented animal magnetism, And if he had not lived, then all the modern practices of mental and spiritual healing, as well as hypnotism, psychology and psychiatry, would not have occurred, because quite clearly all these practices and disciplines 
are the essence of the human condition. And if Franz Anton Mesmer had not started the ball rolling, then some other historical person would have. This article attempts to address the fact that the historical person, Franz Anton Mesmer, was the genius who started the ball rolling, and for that reason alone, his name deserves to appear in lights in the history of human civilization. The name of Franz Anton Mesmer should have top billing. <laughs>